Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of our Uplift Bible Study broadcast. Truly, this is another great day that the Lord has made, and I hope and I pray that you are as excited as I am to be present in this virtual space one more time. Wherever you are and wherever you're watching from, I want you to know you came to the right place. And I'm excited that you're here and I would invite you to go ahead and share uh, this experience with someone, even as you're commenting, even as you're saying uh, hello to me and to each other. Go ahead and share this link. We're live on Facebook. We're live on our app and even on YouTube right now. So wherever you're watching this from, go ahead and share that link. Click it and share that link with someone so we can get. Uh, as many people attached to this experience as possible. I'm just excited. I hope you're having a great week uh, thus far. Looking forward to the weekend and we'll talk about the weekend uh, as we get to the end uh, of this experience. But just excited to be back in this space again. And I'm excited about this series that we're about to jump into. Shouts out to our media ministry, uh, both on the audio and video sides of things. They work very hard behind the scenes uh, to make this viewable and audible for you. So thank you, lady and gentlemen, uh, for your hard work behind the scenes. We applaud them each and every chance we get. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. And let's ask his blessing uh, upon us and let's see what he has to say to us tonight. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you for this opportunity, this privilege that you've given to us. I thank you for clear thoughts and a clear space to be able to witness your work. We believe you're working through us and speaking through us. So I pray that you move through these airwaves and meet us where we are individually, all of us at different points in our journey. But thank you for meeting us where we are and pulling us and growing us to where you would have us to be. I ask these things and I thank you in advance for what you will do in this space in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. So um, for the past two months or a little more, we've been uh, engaged in a series uh, talking about staying focused on the assignment and that whole journey with Nehemiah and his people. And so the Lord has uh, shifted us now. We've completed that series and we're moving now into this new series talking about signs from God. And so I want you to meet me in the book of Acts, chapter number four. And I just need to read verses 10 through 12. Acts chapter four, the Acts of the the Apostles, chapter four, beginning with verse number 10. And Peter is speaking. He says, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man, talking about himself, stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, Neither is there salvation in any other. Listen to this. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So reads the word of our God. And so the first sign, the first sign from God that I want to talk about Uh, is simply one way, one way. You've seen the signs that highlight you going down a one way street. Um, And God forbid you ever go the opposite way up a one way street. But what Peter makes very clear is the first sign that, that you and I need to be aware of is the sign that says one way. 
All right, so everything that I'm about to say to you, everything that I'm going to teach you in this lesson is a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. And I say faith versus fact because there are many facts in the world. Um, Many people believe that, you know, the world is over 4.5 billion years old, give or take 50 million years. And so scientists would consider that to be a fact. But unless you were there in the beginning, when the beginning began, even that fact is still a matter of faith. You still have to trust and believe that what you're being told by scientists is true. Right. All of the scientific theories that are out there, all the mathematical theories that are out there, all of the stories, all of the legends, if you will, that you've been told over the years, all the narratives that you are familiar with. What I'm going to teach you tonight, uh, I can argue is a matter of fact, but the only reason I can say it's fact is because it's a matter of our faith. Faith is what you believe based on experience. Faith is what you hold dear in your heart. And although there may be facts, quote unquote, out there that would contradict what your faith context tells you, it is your faith at the end of the day that you stand on. It's what you believe. And so what I'm teaching you tonight is a matter of faith. People of faith would have to embrace what it is that I'm saying. I cannot prove to you how old the world is. But by faith, we believe that in the beginning, God, right? I cannot prove to you that the Red Sea was split and parted and dry land for God's people to walk through. And then when the enemy's camp came through it, God closed it back up and drowned them. I can't prove that. But my faith says that it happened. I cannot prove that. A man named Noah built, let's just call it a big old boat called an ark, right? And that two of every animal that existed at that time, elephants and all, were placed on that ship. I cannot prove that to you as a matter of fact, but by faith, we believe it happened. Right? By faith, we believe what the Bible says. And so when it comes to this thing that we call salvation, Peter is making, uh, you can call it a sermon, you can call it a a presentation, you could even call it uh, an oral defense for this faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And he's doing this post Pentecost. Remember, Uh, When they were in the upper room, we just celebrate celebrated Pentecost a couple months ago and they were in this room and the Holy Spirit fell down upon all that were in that room. And everybody from different places and different walks of life were now hearing each other in their own language. And so they made the statement, those that were in that room, how is this possible? These folk must be drunk. And the dialogue that Peter then gives is explaining to them the best he can what has happened. He said, they're not drunk, as you suppose. These are the ones who have been washed in the blood of the lamb. These are the ones that were prophesied by the prophet Joel that your sons and your daughters would prophesy. And so he's making this speech. He's giving them this sermon, this monologue, attempting to break down what it is our belief and our faith is in Jesus Christ. And so he says, be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel, anybody that's got any questions about it, that by the name of Jesus Christ that you crucified, the one that y'all hung on the cross, the one that on the third day God raised from the dead, even by him am I standing here today. I I, I got so much on that. Your faith is based on your experience. 
What you believe about God is based on your experience with him. Have you ever heard someone say in church, maybe in devotion or maybe somebody else, a preacher, maybe the choir sang it. They say, you can't make me doubt him. Why? Because I know too much about him. Peter is saying, I got experience with him. And so he's the only reason, Jesus is, that I'm standing here today. When he met me at the seaside and I was rough around the edges and he took me as I was and he even went to my house and healed my mother-in-law that was sick. I saw that with my own eyes. You can't make me doubt that because my faith is based on my experience with him. I walked with him. I talked with him. I saw the miracles. I saw what he did in other people's lives. I was there on that mountaintop when he was transfigured and Moses and Elijah showed up. It was me and James and John that were there to see that because we were in his inner circle. I know too much about him. That Thursday evening in the garden when he was praying and he asked us to pray. And yeah, I, I admit it. Me and the other fellas, we fell asleep on him. We, we, we let him down. But when we woke up and he said he was ready to go and those soldiers came to arrest him, I was the one that pulled out my blade and cut a man's ear off for Jesus. I know too much about him and he knows a lot about me. And sure enough, that Friday he went to trial and unfortunately I, I denied him. I acted like I didn't know him. I'm a disciple. I, I'm, a, I'm a man of God, but there have been times where I act like I didn't know him. Yes, I'm guilty of that. The rooster told on me. All of that's in my experience. Listen, you better be honest about your story. You better be honest about your experiences in life and with the Lord. It wasn't all glory, glory and hallelujah. Some of it was we denied him. We act like we didn't know him. We went left. He told us to go right. We knew he was the way, but we went the other way. That's our testimony, too. And he died on that cross. And sure enough, Sunday morning, he came looking for me. Tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. Peter is saying that this Jesus is the only reason that I'm standing here. He's the stone, if you will, that the builders rejected. All of this is our faith context. We believe, like I said to you last Sunday, that he is the foundation and that he is the chief cornerstone of our faith. Peter said that he's the stone that y'all rejected. The Jews he's talking to. Y'all rejected him. Y'all didn't want him. But the building can't stand without him. Right? Neither is there salvation in any other. Let's, let, let me get to these points before I be done gave away the whole lesson. Understand when you talk about salvation, you're talking about the answer for one's sin. What is sin? Sin is a debt that requires restitution. Sin is a debt. And all of us know what debt is, is when you owe. Sin is a debt that requires restitution. What is restitution? That means you got to make it right. You can um, you can do wrong by somebody or, or possibly commit a crime. And guess what? You can be found innocent in court. But then what the courts will circle back and do is make you pay restitution. If you stole from somebody, you got to pay them back what it was worth. If you cause somebody to lose income or lose money or you took something that didn't belong to you. They require you to pay that back and then some restitution. Many of you heard about the court case of this particular um, television and Internet commentator who made some remarks about the children and their families that were killed up at Sandy Hook. 
when those young people lost their lives at the elementary school. This individual got on television and got on his internet show to his millions of viewers and said it never happened. Them children aren't really dead. That's a hoax. So you can already tell what side of the aisle he's on just by that word he used because some other guy liked to use the word hoax too. He said it didn't happen. Now, that man did not kill anyone. That man did not steal from anyone. But those parents took him to court. And just the other day, the judge ruled that he is financially liable and got to pay restitution for the pain and suffering that he caused those families. Because he lied. Can you imagine you losing your loved one and then some fool gets on the internet talking about they ain't really dead. That didn't really happen. It's a hoax. So the courts decided that you are wrong and that you got to pay restitution. You're going to have to make that right. You a millionaire. Good, because you're going to pay some millions to these families. And so our sin. Is a debt that requires righteous restitution in other words y'all it's a debt that we can't pay to be clear all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God that's why salvation is necessary that's why restitution is necessary but the problem is I can't pay it myself David said what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his mercies in my life. What, what could I possibly give God to make up for the lies I told? What could I possibly offer God to make up for the sins that I've committed in my life? What could you possibly present to God? Because remember, the Bible says that all of our righteousness is like a filthy rag to God. He didn't say a washcloth. He didn't say a towel. He said a rag. Dish rag rag you wash the car with a a, a, a a rag that you shine the white walls with something you don't even plan to bring back in the house no more just a rag you plan to throw away after you used it our righteousness is no good to God your 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 reputation your good name your perfect record. I've never done this and I've never done that. And I just don't understand how people can do this or that. Your, your, your personal sense of, of accomplishment. God said, ain't none of that good in front of me. So there's got to be righteous restitution for sin. In the Old Testament days, they used to bring a lamb. We're getting closer now. They used to bring a lamb to be slaughtered and the blood that was shed was for you heard this on first Sunday the remission of their sin for restitution because the price had to be paid brothers and sisters there's not enough goats or lambs at the zoo to make up for our sins there's not enough blood that we could shed because it requires righteous restitution so there's nothing that we could have done to make up for it, but it's a debt that's got to be paid. So what did God do? He sent his only son, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's why Peter said in his speech, there is no other name. There's only one way. There's only one name given unto men in heaven or on earth whereby we can be saved and that's the name of Jesus why did I say to you in the beginning that um, this is a matter of faith because you got to believe that that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is your way to salvation well now pastor what about you know other faiths and what about you know other books and what about you know other you know religious figures that are out there get this this is number two there are many religions but only one redeemer one way street y'all there's many religions out here 
There are many faith contexts out here. There are many books that have been written. There have been many powerful men and women across the centuries, right, who have done powerful things. And there have been great religious leaders and thought provokers and what have you. But here is the issue. None of them have an answer for your sin problem. I've read a little something about the Muslim faith, the Islamic faith. I've read a little something about the Buddhist faith. I've read a little something about the Hindu faith. But the problem with all of those is, is that they don't have an answer for the sin problem. Buddha ain't died for nobody's sins and doesn't claim to. Muhammad I believe was a profound and powerful man, but he was just that a man. And he never said nothing about I'm dying for your sin debt. Right? All these other thought leaders and these deep people and these religious figures, they all carry some weight in terms of, you know, helping you live a better life and helping you to be a better person. I ain't talking about being a better person. I'm talking about being saved. And the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. It's many religions, but there's only one redeemer. And his name is Jesus the Christ. The one who died for our sins. Remember I said a righteous restitution because he is the lamb without spot, uh, without spot or blemish. And by faith, we believe that. By faith, we believe that his payment covered everything. What if you got a letter in the mail tomorrow that said your mortgage was paid off? What if what if what if them folks from General Motors and from Ford and from Honda and from Toyota and from wherever else? What if what if your credit union called you and they said, um, I don't know how this happened, but your car note is paid off. Lord have mercy. What if what what if I got into Southern University and found out that my son's tuition was paid in full? I, I would have to get up from this seat and, and take a few laps around this church and just say, thank you, Lord. Well, guess what? Your sin debt is paid off. Because Jesus paid it all. And when we're talking about one redeemer, when we're talking about one way, this is your first sign. The the most important sign for the Christian is the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. For him, it was an emblem of suffering and shame. But for us, it is an emblem of our salvation. That's why that songwriter said that I'll cherish the old rugged cross. That's why another songwriter said, Jesus, keep me near the cross because the cross is my sign. That's my one way street. That's my reminder that my sins have been washed away. What does the blood of Jesus do? This is number three. The blood of Jesus intercedes on our behalf. Oh, this is good. If you if you didn't know what an intercessor was, just hang on for, for the next 60 seconds. An intercessor is the middleman. It's the go between. And so if you can imagine the blood of Jesus pays the debt. Right. So that means now when God looks at you and he would normally see Romans 323 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now he sees Romans 10 9. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. Now he doesn't see 323. He sees 10 9. Now he sees 316. John, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, you can't die. You can't perish. You can't go to hell anymore. You got to have everlasting life because the blood has served as your middleman. Have you ever felt intimidated to go talk to somebody? Maybe because you didn't know them like that or you didn't have a relationship like that. Or maybe, you know, they were just so big of a presence that you just didn't feel comfortable. But then, you know, somebody that knows them at that point, you're not in that room 
Because of you, you're in that room because you're connected to them and they usher you into that room. And as long as you stay with them, you know you all right. So at that point, the blood of Jesus serves as the intercessor. The only reason I can go to heaven is because the blood is covering me. When, when you, um, yeah, when, when you were going to, to the amusement park, I'll start there. When you were going to the amusement park, they would stamp your, your, your hand so that you get on every ride. If somebody, you know, had 20 or 30 dollars more, they, they, they paid for you to get that stamp so that you could get on every single ride. Listen, everything we enjoy is because we've been stamped It's because we've been covered. Every blessing that life has presented you with is because you were stamped, you were covered. I was about to say that when you went in the club, they stamped your hand. You know, but you, you don't know nothing about that. You, you, you saved Christian you. But you get that wristband or you get that stamp on your hand. And guess what? Even when you think, thank you, Lord. Even when you think you've washed it off, they'll shine a light on you. And you'll be able to still see that the stamp is there. Listen, this salvation thing don't wash off. You can't lose it. I don't care how many days it's been. I don't care how many months, how many years it's been since you met Jesus. Every time that light, he is the light of the world, you know. Every time he shines that light on you, the stamp is still there. You're still covered. Don't care what else gets on you. As long as that blood stays on you. Just like the children of Israel, when God sent that death angel through Egypt and he said, only the doors that are covered in blood. He's, God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Everybody in Egypt lost their firstborn, including Pharaoh's son. But all of the houses that were covered in the blood, God's people were covered even back then. Do you not know that was a symbol of your redeemer? A whole lot of things could have happened to me. A whole lot of stuff should have happened to me. A whole lot of folk wish some stuff would happen to you. But because you were covered in the blood, God says you can't touch him. And so the blood of Jesus intercedes. He runs interference on our behalf. Can, can you just take 20 seconds? I, I, I want to take a a break for station identification. Can you just take 20 seconds and thank God for all of the times God had you covered for every room you walked into that you didn't deserve to be in, but God gave you that opportunity for every promotion you got, for every opportunity you got, for every day he let you see after you messed up, for every chance he gave you after your third chance was messed up. It was because he covered you. I'm telling you, he is not a way to salvation. He is the way. I know there's many ways to get to your house from from your job. I know there's many ways to get home from the church. I know there's many ways to get to Walmart from where you are. And there's about five or six different Walmarts you can choose from. I know there's many ways and many options, but when it comes to salvation, ain't but one. There's one way to get to heaven. If you're trying to go to heaven, ain't but one way. Now there's plenty of ways to go to hell. Plenty of ways, plenty of opportunities, plenty of routes you can take if that's where you're trying to go. But if you're trying to get where Jesus is, there's only one way. And so, as I said to you this past Sunday, um, God demands our allegiance, but he ain't going to force it. This is your last point. We out of here. Salvation is a gift that we have to accept on our own free will. You got to accept it. You, you have to say with your mouth, I believe Jesus Christ to be the free part of my sin. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was raised on the third day. I believe he lives in my heart. If you can believe that, if you can say that much by faith, you're saved. Nobody forced that on you. 
Nobody made you walk down an aisle. Nobody forced you to accept Christ. It's got to be by your own free will. See, this group um, that Peter was talking to, this group of Jews, understand to be a Jew is not just a religious thing. To be a Jew is also a racial thing. It's a cultural thing. You're born a Jew. Jesus was born a Jew. So at that point, he really had no choice of what religion he was going to practice, what faith context he was going to live out. What the Bible say from his very infancy, it was their custom to go to the temple. Right. He grew up going to temple. He was a Jewish boy. He grew up as a rabbi. He was trained in Old Testament. He knew the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, the first five books. As a Jewish young person, you had to memorize that before you got bar mitzvah. Before you were given your rights as a Jew, you had to know all of that. But the thing about being a Christian is that you have to choose this. Just because my daddy was a preacher, is a preacher, or just because my mother been in church all her life, that don't have anything to do with my salvation. I still got to choose for myself. Right? Can't get into heaven on grandma's religion. My great granddaddy was a preacher. They ain't got nothing to do with my soul going to heaven. Now, they can expose you. They can put you in a position where you can hear the gospel. That's why we say train up our children, right? That's why we have them in this environment so that at some point they can hear the Lord's voice for themselves and then they come forward. But we don't force them down the aisle. We don't make them jump in the baptism pool. They got to do that on their own because this cannot be forced. You got to accept Christ. On your own free will. That's what I appreciate about um, we're going to call it Christianity. That's, that's why I appreciate Christianity, because God ain't going to make you eat this and eat that or wear this or wear that. He ain't going to make you do this or do that. No, you got to accept what his word says on your own. And if you don't do it, then that's on you. But nobody can force you. To dress a certain way. Nobody can force you to eat or drink or not eat or drink or force you to have a certain lifestyle. No, that lifestyle change, thank you, Holy Ghost, comes after you get saved and then the Lord start working on your heart. Then you can say the things I used to do, I don't do no more. But you cannot live a certain way just because somebody told you to live a certain way because that doesn't happen in your heart. That's why you can be one way in church and then be a different person when you leave from here because it ain't happened in your heart yet. That's why you can sing, oh, how I love Jesus and then cuss people out. Because it ain't happened in your heart yet. But the more time you spend with the Lord, you ought to be less mean than you used to be. Once he get in your heart, you ought to be less confrontational than you used to be. Right? But the fact that somebody wrote down some rules and told you this, what you got to do in order to be a Christian. That's not how this works. You have to accept it on your own free will. Otherwise it's not love. Nobody forced Jesus to go on a cross. Fact about it. He had a choice and made the choice to die for us. Nobody forced him that Thursday night in the garden. That could have been it. He wrestled with it, right? God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he made up his mind. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. They hung him on that cross and he could have called a legion of angels down to come and save him. Jesus could have got it popping at Calvary. But he never said a mumbling word. And then when he did open his mouth to speak, what did he say? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. So even he made a choice. So for that reason, you and I got to make a choice too. let me be clear as I as I summarize this whole lesson here. There's only one way. And we believe that by faith. Well, pastor, what about the people who live in some third world country that have never heard the name of Jesus before? You telling me that if they die and they didn't accept Christ, that they're going to go to hell? 
What I believe by faith, I can't prove this because nobody's ever come back and told me, but I believe that if that person closes their eyes, I believe there is a moment where God introduces himself to that person and gives even them the opportunity. I'm talking about folk that live in the Amazon and they worship in the trees and they believe in the sun God and all this other stuff. Never heard of the gospel before, right? I believe that when they close their eyes and sleep the sleep of death, there is a middle passage between this world and the next world where God introduces himself to everybody because he doesn't want anybody to perish. God is, is a just God. So he's not going to let somebody suffer for what they didn't know. But for you listening to me right now. Now you're held accountable because you've heard the gospel. Now you got a choice to make because you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if you're here. And you are in that space where you say, well, you know, I, I need to make a decision. Get right with God and do it now. There's only one way, accept Christ and walk by faith today. I can't prove everything that's in the Bible. I can't argue with these people that want to debate the Bible with me. I cannot answer every accusation. I cannot justify everything that God has said in his word, but I believe it by faith. Because if we don't believe this, then what are we doing? We're, we're wasting our time. If I don't truly believe what I'm telling you right now, I need to go find something else to do. I, I need to go pick up my trumpet and dust it off and go sit in the jazz club and try to make some money. I need to get out of this business here. I, I need to go find some. I need to go teach school again or something. Because if I don't truly believe this. I'm, I'm wasting your time and mine. If you don't truly believe in your heart. That salvation is the way, then you'll always live guilty. You'll always live feeling like you got to make up for something. You'll always feel as if you're unloved and unworthy. But if you accept Christ into your heart, I'm telling you, it, it, it's, it's a peace that I can't even describe. To know that when I step out of this room and life confronts me, that I'm not going through it by myself because I got the Lord on my side. It's not about sending anybody to hell. We, we don't send people to hell. But if I present you with a ticket to get on a plane and you choose not to go, you got left. That was your problem. You chose not to take the ticket. The ticket was paid for all expense paid trip and you decided not to go. Well, now 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 you've made a choice to stay here. You made a choice to go to wherever you could afford. And with our sin record, the only thing we can afford, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Don't, this is the first sign. I'm going to get into that sign when God tells you to stop or when God tells you to yield or when God tells you to look out for children. All of these are signs, but the first sign you need is one way. And some people at the end of their life are going to run into either the grace or the wrath of God because of which way you chose to go. Jesus was talking about heaven one day, somewhere around John 14 chapter. Jesus was talking about heaven to his disciples and Thomas just didn't understand it. He was like, well, now how are we going to get there? How can we know the way you say you going away from us? But how are we going to get there? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the light. How do I get to peace? He is the, the one way. How do I get to real joy? Because happy comes and goes. So I don't even fool with happy. How do I get to joy? He's the only way. How do I get light for my path? He's the only way. What can wash away my sins? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus ain't no ain't no statue that that statue that I drive past on Monroe Street to my right over there. I don't know if it's Buddhist. I don't know if it's Hindu, but they got a nice little statue out there. That statue ain't saved nobody. 
Can't do it. Hmm. You go to Atlanta, you can see a monument built to Dr. King. Dr. King can't save nobody. You go to wherever Mount Rushmore is and you see these big stone heads that are carved out of the mountain of all our past presidents, the great ones, so they say. They can't save nobody. They say Lincoln freed the slaves. He ain't freed nobody. And nobody, there's no other name given unto men that we can be saved. Only the name of Jesus. I ain't talking about no statue. I'm talking about a savior who died on a cross and lives today at the cross where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there, not by fact. It was there by faith that I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. Even when I'm struggling, I got joy. Even when I have grief going on in my life, I still have joy because I'm going down a one way street. And I will run into the devil on that street. I will run into trial and tribulation on that street. I will run into adversity on that street. But as long as I'm with Jesus, I'm going to stay that way. Broad is the way I'm trying to let y'all go here. Broad is the way that leads to destruction and a whole lot of folk go down that road. But Jesus said narrow is the way that leads to righteousness. And that's the route that I want to take. So don't don't be surprised if folks don't want to walk with you once you start walking with Jesus. Don't be surprised if people don't want to travel with you once you start trying to live better, trying to do a little bit better, you know. Can't quite, you know, feel comfortable in some of the spaces and environments that you used to hang in. That's because you're going up a one way street now. Right. But don't be surprised when people fall away. Don't be surprised when people are no longer comfortable around you. It's because you're going down a one way street. With Jesus. And so we're giving you that invitation right now to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. All you got to do right now is just put in the chat, I, I want to join or I want to be saved and become part of this fellowship. And if you can sincerely believe in your heart that he died for your sins, was raised on the third day, my friend, you say no questions asked. What about my past? You, you saved. It's washed away. The only one bringing it up is you. And the devil to make you feel bad. But it's all washed away. And so you got to accept him. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you. Thank you for our salvation and that we met you in time. I thank you for the journey that we're on with you one way. And we believe we're on our way to see you one day in heaven. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to continue this walk in. We'll walk it by faith and not by sight. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 We've done as the Lord has commanded and we find that there is still room. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I, I get energized when I talk about Jesus and um, we call this the fundamentals of our faith. This is like just basic foundational stuff. Salvation 101. It's like the ABCs you know, of, of our faith, the one, two, threes of our faith. And I'm, I, I get excited um, when I get to talk about just those beliefs that we have. And I think that's the best sign we can follow that one way, one way. And um, next week we'll deal with another sign. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you in this space. Listen, let's let's uh, prepare ourselves to give very quickly. Uh, there are three ways that you can give to this ministry. Of course, you can send your gift in 2333 Lake Bradford Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32310. You can also utilize our app and also our cash app. Vision 300 is our cash tag. And then our website, jacobchapel.org. I want to thank the number of you, our distant friends uh, who have been giving electronically and you even sent your gifts in the mail. We have been doing some upgrades to our 
uh, system. And so you may find that it has been difficult for you to log on or catch the different links to live streams. And so we've been working diligently and our media team uh, has been working diligently behind the scenes to make sure that our links get updated. We're on YouTube now. Uh, and so we want you to be able to uh, log in and you can still give in the traditional ways that you have been giving. So thank you for that. Please remember your 90 for 90 pledge and uh, put denote on whatever uh, mechanism you're using, whether it's your check, your envelope or your uh, notes section electronically, what you're giving towards. Also, uh, there are a number of individuals that we're praying for. Uh, and so those names get updated each and every week. And so names are being added and taken away even as we speak. Uh, but we're continuing to pray uh, for Sister Clara Porter uh, and her family as they continue to care for her mom. Uh, who is still ill and we're praying for her brother Ray Daniels who had to funeralize his brother earlier this week continuing to pray for everyone that's in the hospital and those that are experiencing uh, just life challenges and life uh, issues so you know what it would be a good idea for us to check on each other I hope you know that the pastor and the deacons are not the only ones who can check on members there are those who are assigned to do so. We got the deacon of the week and all of that stuff. And of course, pastor does his best. But again, you as a member of the body of Christ, you ought to be checking on your brothers and sisters. If you haven't seen somebody in church in a long time, you need to check on them. Ask them where they are. Ask them, you know, if everything is all right, because I'm, I'm seeing my members some everywhere except church. Uh, and and I, I ain't fussing. I'm just saying, you know, let, let's check on each other. Some folks are doing all right, uh, but there are just other folks who may be dealing with some life challenges. So I, I challenge you uh, to be a good church member and a part of this community of faith. And you reach out to some of these names that you see um, that are going through. All right. I'm just old fashioned that way. I believe we ought to look out, you know, for each other. And it's not just pastor and deacons. All right. Lastly, uh, I want to invite you to read with us. We are a reading family. And so as a church, we are reading together in the month of August, what Google can't give. This is a book that's going to teach us uh, how to minister to those that are millennials and that whole age group. I'm a part of Gen X. And so I'm, I'm right there at the tail end of Generation X, right before the millennials came along after me. And so we need to know that there's some things that this Internet can't give you, you know, stuff like community and fellowship. You can't get that on no Facebook. So you need to actually be a part of the church. That's what this book is talking about. How do we reach millennials in this day and age? Right. We sing it all the time to serve this present age. Also, in the month of September, if you want to read ahead, we're reading John Eldridge's book called Resilient. Uh, just how do you find your way through restoring, you know, yourself from worrying and anxiety in these turbulent times. So I'm looking forward to us reading that together in September. Our young people are reading as well. And so I would invite you to get these books for your young people. Grace Byers wrote a book called I Am Enough. And then uh, our teens are reading John Ortberg's The Me That I Want To Be. So please, y'all get those books. Lastly, lastly, but certainly not least, uh, I'm asking for your prayers because on Sundays we have started a new series of messages that I am just on fire about in, in down in my soul. I'm excited about this new series talking about a house of cards. And if you were with us this past Sunday, part one, we introduced it to you. Accept the Lord, build the house. And so this coming Sunday, we'll be talking from the subject enemy of the state. But God has already given me six sermons and I've written four of them already. And so I'm looking forward to seeing you in this space, either live or virtually streaming. But I want to see you in the place. We're going to be preaching and teaching from the word of God. And of course, on Thursdays, we're going to continue with these signs from God in this very space that you're watching right now. So until we meet again. You all continue to stay safe, uh, do what you can to keep yourself safe. I hope that our kids had a great first day of school here locally on yesterday and today and um, praying for our teachers as we move forward. But in the meantime, you all take care and thank you for being with us. We'll see you soon in some other space at some other time. You all take care.